for stopping by Sheila's audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain per United States copyright law. This story is about Hastings is sent back to England from the First World War due to injury and is invited to spend his sick leave at the beautiful Stars Court by his old friend John Cavendish. Here, Hastings meets John's stepmother, Mrs. Inglethorpe, and her new husband, Alfred. Despite the tranquil surroundings, Hastings begins to realize that all is not right. When Mrs. Inglethorpe is found poisoned, suspicion falls on the family, and another old friend, Hercule Poirot, is invited to investigate. Still beaming, Poirot marshaled us all into the drawing room, bringing forward chairs as he did so. Miss Howard here. Mademoiselle Cynthia. Monsieur Lawrence. The good Dorcas. And Annie. Yan. We must delay our proceedings a few minutes until Mr. Inglethorpe arrives. I have sent him a note. Miss Howard rose immediately from her seat. If that man comes into the house, I leave it. No, no. Poirot went up to her and pleaded in a low voice. Finally Miss Howard consented to return to her chair. A few minutes later Alfred Inglethorpe entered the room. The company once assembled, Poirot rose from his seat with the air of a popular lecturer, and bowed politely to his audience. Messieurs, mesdames, as you all know, I was called in by Monsieur John Cavendish to investigate this case. I at once examined the bedroom of the deceased which, by the advice of the doctors, had been kept locked, and was consequently exactly as it had been when the tragedy occurred. I found, first, a fragment of green material, second, a stain on the carpet near the window, still damp, thirdly, an empty box of bromide powders. To take the fragment of green material first, I found it caught in the bolt of the communicating door between that room and the adjoining one occupied by Mademoiselle Cynthia. I handed the fragment over to the police who did not consider it of much importance. Nor did they recognize it for what it was a piece torn from a green land armlet. There was a little stir of excitement. Now there was only one person at Stiles who worked on the land, Mrs. Cavendish. Therefore it must have been Mrs. Cavendish who entered the deceased's room through the door communicating with Mademoiselle Cynthia's room. But that door was bolted on the inside. I cried. When I examined the room, yes. But in the first place we have only her word for it, since it was she who tried that particular door and reported it fastened. In the ensuing confusion she would have had ample opportunity to shoot the bolt across. I took an early opportunity of verifying my conjectures. To begin with, the fragment corresponds exactly with a tear in Mrs. Cavendish's armlet. Also, at the inquest, Mrs. Cavendish declared that she had heard, from her own room, the fall of the table by the bed. I took an early opportunity of testing that statement by stationing my friend Monsieur Hastings in the left wing of the building, just outside Mrs. Cavendish's door. I myself, in company with the police, went to the deceased's room, and whilst there I, apparently accidentally, knocked over the table in question, but found that, as I had expected, Monsieur Hastings had heard no sound at all. This confirmed my belief that Mrs. Cavendish was not speaking the truth when she declared that she had been dressing in her room at the time of the tragedy. In fact, I was convinced that, far from having been in her own room, Mrs. Cavendish was actually in the deceased's room when the alarm was given. I shot a quick glance at Mary. She was very pale, but smiling. I proceeded to reason on that assumption. Mrs. Cavendish is in her mother-in-law's room. We will say that she is seeking for something and has not yet found it. Suddenly Mrs. Inglethorpe awakens and is seized with an alarming paroxysm. She flings out her arm, overturning the bed table, and then pulls desperately at the bell. Mrs. Cavendish, startled, drops her candle, scattering the grease on the carpet. She picks it up, and retreats quickly to Mademoiselle Cynthia's room, closing the door behind her. She hurries out into the passage, for the servants must not find her where she is. But it is too late. Already footsteps are echoing along the gallery which connects the two wings. What can she do? Quick as thought, she hurries back to the young girl's room, and starts shaking her awake.
the hastily aroused household come trooping down the passage. They are all busily battering at Mrs. Inglethorpe's door. It occurs to nobody that Mrs. Cavendish has not arrived with the rest, but and this is significant, I can find no one who saw her come from the other wing. He looked at Mary Cavendish. Am I right, madam? She bowed her head. Quite right, monsieur. You understand that, if I had thought I would do my husband any good by revealing these facts, I would have done so. But it did not seem to me to bear upon the question of his guilt or innocence. In a sense, that is correct, madam. But it cleared my mind of many misconceptions, and left me free to see other facts in their true significance. The will! cried Lawrence. Then it was you, Mary, who destroyed the will? She shook her head, and Poirot shook his also. No, he said quietly. There is only one person who could possibly have destroyed that will, Mrs. Inglethorpe herself. Impossible! I exclaimed. She had only made it out that very afternoon. Nevertheless, mon ami, it was Mrs. Inglethorpe. Because, in no other way can you account for the fact that, on one of the hottest days of the year, Mrs. Inglethorpe ordered a fire to be lighted in her room. I gave a gasp. What idiots we had been never to think of that fire as being incongruous. Poirot was continuing. The temperature on that day, messieurs, was eighty degrees in the shade. Yet Mrs. Inglethorpe ordered a fire. Why? Because she wished to destroy something, and could think of no other way, you will remember that, in consequence of the war economics practiced at Stiles, no waste paper was thrown away. There was therefore no means of destroying a thick document such as a will. The moment I heard of a fire being lighted in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room, I leapt to the conclusion that it was to destroy some important document, possibly a will. So the discovery of the charred fragment in the grate was no surprise to me. I did not, of course, know at the time that the will in question had only been made this afternoon, and I will admit that, when I learnt that fact, I fell into a grievous error. I came to the conclusion that Mrs. Inglethorpe's determination to destroy her will arose as a direct consequence of the quarrel she had that afternoon, and that therefore the quarrel took place after, and not before the making of the will. Here, as we know, I was wrong, and I was forced to abandon that idea. I faced the problem from a new standpoint. Now, at four o'clock, Dorcas overheard her mistress saying angrily, you need not think that any fear of publicity, or scandal between husband and wife will deter me. I conjectured, and conjectured rightly, that these words were addressed, not to her husband, but to Mr. John Cavendish. At five o'clock, an hour later, she uses almost the same words, but the standpoint is different. She admits to Dorcas, I don't know what to do, scandal between husband and wife is a dreadful thing. At four o'clock she has been angry, but completely mistress of herself. At five o'clock she is in violent distress, and speaks of having had a great shock. Looking at the matter psychologically, I drew one deduction which I was convinced was correct. The second scandal she spoke of was not the same as the first and it concerned herself. Let us reconstruct. At four o'clock, Mrs. Inglethorpe quarrels with her son, and threatens to denounce him to his wife who, by the way, overheard the greater part of the conversation. At four-thirty, Mrs. Inglethorpe, in consequence of a conversation on the validity of wills, makes a will in favour of her husband, which the two gardeners witness. At five o'clock, Dorcas finds her mistress in a state of considerable agitation, with a slip of paper, a letter, Dorcas thinks in her hand, and it is then that she orders the fire in her room to be lighted. Presumably, then, between four-thirty and five o'clock, something has occurred to occasion a complete revolution of feeling, since she is now as anxious to destroy the will, as she was before to make it. What was that something? As far as we know, she was quite alone during that half-hour. Nobody entered or left that boudoir. What then occasioned this sudden change of sentiment? One can only guess, but I believe my guess to be correct. Mrs. Inglethorpe had no stamps in her desk. We know this, because later she asked Dorcas to bring her some. Now in the opposite corner of the room stood her husband's desk, locked. She was anxious to find some stamps, and, according to my theory, she tried her own keys in the desk.
that one of them fitted it I know. She therefore opened the desk, and in searching for the stamps she came across something else, that slip of paper which Dorcas saw in her hand, and which assuredly was never meant for Mrs. Inglethorpe's eyes. On the other hand, Mrs. Cavendish believed that the slip of paper to which her mother-in-law clung so tenaciously was a written proof of her own husband's infidelity. She demanded it from Mrs. Inglethorpe who assured her, quite truly, that it had nothing to do with that matter. Mrs. Cavendish did not believe her. She thought that Mrs. Inglethorpe was shielding her stepson. Now Mrs. Cavendish is a very resolute woman, and, behind her mask of reserve, she was madly jealous of her husband. She determined to get hold of that paper at all costs, and in this resolution chance came to her aid. She happened to pick up the key of Mrs. Inglethorpe's dispatch case, which had been lost that morning. She knew that her mother-in-law invariably kept all important papers in this particular case. Mrs. Cavendish, therefore, made her plans as only a woman driven desperate through jealousy could have done. Sometime in the evening she unbolted the door leading into Mademoiselle Cynthia's room. Possibly she applied oil to the hinges, for I found that it opened quite noiselessly when I tried it. She put off her project until the early hours of the morning as being safer, since the servants were accustomed to hearing her move about her room at that time. She dressed completely in her land kit, and made her way quietly through Mademoiselle Cynthia's room into that of Mrs. Inglethorpe. He paused a moment and Cynthia interrupted. But I should have woken up if anyone had come through my room? Not if you were drugged, Mademoiselle. Drugged. Maze, we. Oui. You remember, he addressed us collectively again, that through all the tumult and noise next door Mademoiselle Cynthia slept. That admitted of two possibilities. Either her sleep was feigned which I did not believe or her unconsciousness was induced by artificial means. With this latter idea in my mind, I examined all the coffee cups most carefully, remembering that it was Mrs. Cavendish who had brought Mademoiselle Cynthia her coffee the night before. I took a sample from each cup, and had them analysed with no result. I had counted the cups carefully, in the event of one having been removed. Six persons had taken coffee, and six cups were duly found. I had to confess myself mistaken. Then I discovered that I had been guilty of a very grave oversight. Coffee had been brought in for seven persons, not six, for Dr. Bowerstein had been there that evening. This changed the face of the whole affair, for there was now one cup missing. The servants noticed nothing, since Annie, the housemaid, who took in the coffee, brought in seven cups, not knowing that Mr. Inglethorpe never drank it, whereas Dorcas, who cleared them away the following morning, found six as usual or strictly speaking she found five, the sixth being the one found broken in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room. I was confident that the missing cup was that of Mademoiselle Cynthia. I had an additional reason for that belief in the fact that all the cups found contained sugar, which Mademoiselle Cynthia never took in her coffee. My attention was attracted by the story of Annie about some salt on the tray of cocoa which she took every night to Mrs. Inglethorpe's room. I accordingly secured a sample of that cocoa, and sent it to be analysed. But that had already been done by Dr. Bowerstein, said Lawrence quickly. Not exactly. The analyst was asked by him to report whether strychnine was, or was not, present. He did not have it tested, as I did, for a narcotic. For a narcotic? Yes. Here is the analyst's report. Mrs. Cavendish administered a safe, but effectual, narcotic to both Mrs. Inglethorpe and Mademoiselle Cynthia. And it is possible that she had a mauvais court d'eur in consequence. Imagine her feelings when her mother-in-law is suddenly taken ill and dies, and immediately after she hears the word poison. She has believed that the sleeping draught she administered was perfectly harmless, but there is no doubt that for one terrible moment she must have feared that Mrs. Inglethorpe's death lay at her door. She is seized with panic, and under its influence she hurries downstairs, and quickly drops the coffee cup and saucer used by Mademoiselle Cynthia into a large brass vase, where it is discovered later by Monsieur Lawrence. The remains of the cocoa she dare not touch. Too many eyes are upon her. Guess at her relief when strychnine is mentioned, and she discovers that after all the tragedy is not her doing. 
We are now able to account for the symptoms of strychnine poisoning being so long in making their appearance. A narcotic taken with strychnine will delay the action of the poison for some hours. Poirot paused. Mary looked up at him, the color slowly rising in her face. All you have said is quite true, Monsieur Poirot. It was the most awful hour of my life. I shall never forget it. But you are wonderful, I understand now. What I meant when I told you that you could safely confess to Papa Poirot, eh? But you would not trust me. I see everything now, said Lawrence. The drugged cocoa, taken on top of the poisoned coffee, amply accounts for the delay. Exactly. But was the coffee poisoned, or was it not? We come to a little difficulty here, since Mrs. Inglethorpe never drank it. What? The cry of surprise was universal. No. You will remember my speaking of a stain on the carpet in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room? There were some peculiar points about that stain. It was still damp, it exhaled a strong odor of coffee, and embedded in the nap of the carpet I found some little splinters of china. What had happened was plain to me, for not two minutes before I had placed my little case on the table near the window, and the table, tilting up, had deposited it upon the floor on precisely the identical spot. In exactly the same way, Mrs. Inglethorpe had laid down her cup of coffee on reaching her room the night before, and the treacherous table had played her the same trick. What happened next is mere guesswork on my part, but I should say that Mrs. Inglethorpe picked up the broken cup and placed it on the table by the bed. Feeling in need of a stimulant of some kind, she heated up her cocoa, and drank it off then and there. Now we are faced with a new problem. We know the cocoa contained no strychnine. The coffee was never drunk. Yet the strychnine must have been administered between seven and nine o'clock that evening. What third medium was there, a medium so suitable for disguising the taste of strychnine that it is extraordinary no one has thought of it? Poirot looked round the room, and then answered himself impressively. Her medicine. Do you mean that the murderer introduced the strychnine into her tonic? I cried. There was no need to introduce it. It was already there in the mixture. The strychnine that killed Mrs. Inglethorpe was the identical strychnine prescribed by Dr. Wilkins. To make that clear to you, I will read you an extract from a book on dispensing which I found in the dispensary of the Red Cross Hospital at Tadminster. The following prescription has become famous in textbooks. Strychnine self 1 grain. Potas bromide 3.6. Aqua add 3.8. Fiat Mistura. This solution deposits in a few hours the greater part of the strychnine salt as an insoluble bromide in transparent crystals. A lady in England lost her life by taking a similar mixture, the precipitated strychnine collected at the bottom, and in taking the last dose she swallowed nearly all of it. Now there was, of course, no bromide in Dr. Wilkins' prescription, but you will remember that I mentioned an empty box of bromide powders, one or two of those powders introduced into the full bottle of medicine would effectually precipitate the strychnine, as the book describes, and cause it to be taken in the last dose. You will learn later that the person who usually poured out Mrs. Inglethorpe's medicine was always extremely careful not to shake the bottle, but to leave the sediment at the bottom of it undisturbed. Throughout the case, there have been evidences that the tragedy was intended to take place on Monday evening. On that day, Mrs. Inglethorpe's bell wire was neatly cut, and on Monday evening Mademoiselle Cynthia was spending the night with friends, so that Mrs. Inglethorpe would have been quite alone in the right wing, completely shut off from help of any kind, and would have died, in all probability, before medical aid could have been summoned but in her hurry to be in time for the village entertainment Mrs. Inglethorpe forgot to take her medicine, and the next day she lunched away from home, so that the last and fatal dose was actually taken twenty-four hours later than had been anticipated by the murderer, and it is owing to that delay that the final proof the last link of the chain is now in my hands. Amid breathless excitement, he held out three thin strips of paper. A letter in the murderer's own handwriting, May Amos. Had it been a little clearer in its terms, it is possible that Mrs. Inglethorpe, warned in time, would have escaped. As it was, she realized her danger, but not the manner of it. In the deathly silence, Poirot pieced together the slips of paper and, 
clearing his throat, read. Dearest Evelyn. You will be anxious at hearing nothing. It is all right only it will be tonight instead of last night. You understand. There's a good time coming once the old woman is dead and out of the way. No one can possibly bring home the crime to me. That idea of yours about the bromides was a stroke of genius. But we must be very circumspect. A full step. Here, my friends, the letter breaks off. Doubtless the writer was interrupted, but there can be no question as to his identity. We all know this handwriting and... A howl that was almost a scream broke the silence. You devil! How did you get it? A chair was overturned. Poirot skipped nimbly aside. A quick movement on his part, and his assailant fell with a crash. Messieurs, mesdames, said Poirot, with a flourish, let me introduce you to the murderer, Mr. Alfred Inglethorpe. Chapter 13 Poirot explains. Poirot, you old villain, I said, I've half a mind to strangle you. What do you mean by deceiving me as you have done? We were sitting in the library. Several hectic days lay behind us, in the room below, John and Mary were together once more, while Alfred Inglethorpe and Miss Howard were in custody. Now at last, I had Poirot to myself, and could relieve my still burning curiosity. Poirot did not answer me for a moment, but at last he said, I did not deceive you, mon ami. At most, I permitted you to deceive yourself. Yes, but why? Well, it is difficult to explain. You see, my friend, you have a nature so honest, and a countenance so transparent, that, en fan, to conceal your feelings is impossible. If I had told you my ideas, the very first time you saw Mr. Alfred Inglethorpe that astute gentleman would have, in your so expressive idiom, smelt a rat. And then, bonjour to our chances of catching him. I think that I have more diplomacy than you give me credit for, my friend, besought Poirot, I implore you, do not enrage yourself. Your help has been of the most invaluable. It is but the extremely beautiful nature that you have, which made me pause. Well, I grumbled, a little mollified. I still think you might have given me a hint. But I did, my friend. Several hints. You would not take them. Think now, did I ever say to you that I believed John Cavendish guilty? Did I not, on the contrary, tell you that he would almost certainly be acquitted? Yes, but. And did I not immediately afterwards speak of the difficulty of bringing the murderer to justice? Was it not plain to you that I was speaking of two entirely different persons? No, I said, it was not plain to me. Then again, continued Poirot, at the beginning, did I not repeat to you several times that I didn't want Mr. Inglethorpe arrested now? That should have conveyed something to you. Do you mean to say you suspected him as long ago as that? Yes. To begin with, whoever else might benefit by Mrs. Inglethorpe's death, her husband would benefit the most. There was no getting away from that. When I went up to Stiles with you that first day, I had no idea as to how the crime had been committed, but from what I knew of Mr. Inglethorpe I fancied that it would be very hard to find anything to connect him with it. When I arrived at the chateau, I realized at once that it was Mrs. Inglethorpe who had burnt the will, and there, by the way, you cannot complain, my friend, for I tried my best to force on you the significance of that bedroom fire in midsummer. Yes, yes, I said impatiently. Go on. Well, my friend, as I say, my views as to Mr. Inglethorpe's guilt were very much shaken. There was, in fact, so much evidence against him that I was inclined to believe that he had not done it. When did you change your mind? When I found that the more efforts I made to clear him, the more efforts he made to get himself arrested. Then, when I discovered that Inglethorpe had nothing to do with Mrs. Reichs and that in fact it was John Cavendish who was interested in that quarter, I was quite sure. But why? Simply this. If it had been Inglethorpe who was carrying on an intrigue with Mrs. Reichs, his silence was perfectly comprehensible. But, when I discovered that it was known all over the village that it was John who was attracted by the farmer's pretty wife, his silence bore quite a different interpretation. It was nonsense to pretend that he was afraid of the scandal, as no possible scandal could attach to him.
This attitude of his gave me furiously to think, and I was slowly forced to the conclusion that Alfred Inglethorpe wanted to be arrested. A. B. N. From that moment, I was equally determined that he should not be arrested. Wait a minute. I don't see why he wished to be arrested. Because, mon ami, it is the law of your country that a man once acquitted can never be tried again for the same offence. Aha! But it was clever, his idea. Assuredly, he is a man of method. See here, he knew that in his position he was bound to be suspected, so he conceived the exceedingly clever idea of preparing a lot of manufactured evidence against himself. He wished to be arrested. He would then produce his irreproachable alibi and, hey presto, he was safe for life. But I still don't see how he managed to prove his alibi, and yet go to the chemist's shop. Poirot stared at me in surprise. Is it possible? My poor friend. You have not yet realized that it was Miss Howard who went to the chemist's shop. Miss Howard? But, certainly. Who else? It was most easy for her. She is of a good height, her voice is deep and manly, moreover, remember, she and Inglethorpe are cousins, and there is a distinct resemblance between them, especially in their gait and bearing. It was simplicity itself. They are a clever pair. I am still a little fogged as to how exactly the bromide business was done, I remarked. Bon. I will reconstruct for you as far as possible. I am inclined to think that Miss Howard was the master mind in that affair. You remember her once mentioning that her father was a doctor? Possibly she dispensed his medicines for him, or she may have taken the idea from one of the many books lying about when Mademoiselle Cynthia was studying for her exam. Anyway, she was familiar with the fact that the addition of a bromide to a mixture containing strychnine would cause the precipitation of the latter. Probably the idea came to her quite suddenly. Mrs. Inglethorpe had a box of bromide powders, which she occasionally took at night. What could be easier than quietly to dissolve one or more of those powders in Mrs. Inglethorpe's large-sized bottle of medicine when it came from Coots? The risk is practically nil. The tragedy will not take place until nearly a fortnight later. If anyone has seen either of them touching the medicine, they will have forgotten it by that time. Miss Howard will have engineered her quarrel, and departed from the house. The lapse of time, and her absence, will defeat all suspicion. Yes, it was a clever idea. If they had left it alone, it is possible the crime might never have been brought home to them. But they were not satisfied. They tried to be too clever, and that was their undoing. Poirot puffed at his tiny cigarette, his eyes fixed on the ceiling. They arranged a plan to throw suspicion on John Cavendish, by buying strychnine at the village chemist's, and signing the register in his handwriting. On Monday Mrs. Inglethorpe will take the last dose of her medicine. On Monday, therefore, at six o'clock, Alfred Inglethorpe arranges to be seen by a number of people at a spot far removed from the village. Miss Howard has previously made up a cock and bull story about him and Mrs. Rikes to account for his holding his tongue afterwards. At six o'clock, Miss Howard, disguised as Alfred Inglethorpe, enters the chemist's shop, with her story about a dog, obtains the strychnine, and writes the name of Alfred Inglethorpe in John's handwriting, which she had previously studied carefully. But, as it will never do if John, too, can prove an alibi, she writes him an anonymous note still copying his handwriting which takes him to a remote spot where it is exceedingly unlikely that anyone will see him. So far, all goes well. Miss Howard goes back to Middlingham. Alfred Inglethorpe returns to Stiles. There is nothing that can compromise him in any way, since it is Miss Howard who has the strychnine, which, after all, is only wanted as a blind to throw suspicion on John Cavendish. But now a hitch occurs. Mrs. Inglethorpe does not take her medicine that night. The broken bell, Cynthia's absence arranged by Inglethorpe through his wife all these are wasted. And then he makes his slip. Mrs. Inglethorpe is out, and he sits down to write to his accomplice, who, he fears, may be in a panic at the non-success of their plan. It is probable that Mrs. Inglethorpe returned earlier than he expected. Caught in the act, and somewhat flurried he hastily shuts and locks his desk. He fears that if he remains in the room he may have to open it again, 
and that Mrs. Inglethorpe might catch sight of the letter before he could snatch it up. So he goes out and walks in the woods, little dreaming that Mrs. Inglethorpe will open his desk and discover the incriminating document. But this, as we know, is what happened. Mrs. Inglethorpe reads it, and becomes aware of the perfidy of her husband and Evelyn Howard, though, unfortunately, the sentence about the bromides conveys no warning to her mind. She knows that she is in danger but is ignorant of where the danger lies. She decides to say nothing to her husband, but sits down and writes to her solicitor, asking him to come on the morrow, and she also determines to destroy immediately the will which she has just made. She keeps the fatal letter. It was to discover that letter, then, that her husband forced the lock of the dispatch case. Yes, and from the enormous risk he ran we can see how fully he realized its importance, that letter accepted, there was absolutely nothing to connect him with the crime. There's only one thing I can't make out, why didn't he destroy it at once when he got hold of it? Because he did not dare take the biggest risk of all, that of keeping it on his own person. I don't understand. Look at it from his point of view. I have discovered that there were only five short minutes in which he could have taken it, the five minutes immediately before our own arrival on the scene, for before that time Annie was brushing the stairs, and would have seen anyone who passed going to the right wing. Figure to yourself the scene. He enters the room, unlocking the door by means of one of the other door keys, they were all much alike. He hurries to the dispatch case, it is locked, and the keys are nowhere to be seen. That is a terrible blow to him, for it means that his presence in the room cannot be concealed as he had hoped. But he sees clearly that everything must be risked for the sake of that damning piece of evidence. Quickly, he forces the lock with a penknife, and turns over the papers until he finds what he is looking for. But now a fresh dilemma arises, he dare not keep that piece of paper on him. He may be seen leaving the room, he may be searched. If the paper is found on him, it is certain doom. Probably, at this minute, too, he hears the sounds below of Mr. Wells and John leaving the boudoir. He must act quickly. Where can he hide this terrible slip of paper? The contents of the waste paper basket are kept and in any case, are sure to be examined. There are no means of destroying it, and he dare not keep it. He looks round, and he sees, what do you think, mon ami? I shook my head. In a moment, he has torn the letter into long thin strips, and rolling them up into spills he thrusts them hurriedly in amongst the other spills in the vase on the mantelpiece. I uttered an exclamation. No one would think of looking there, Poirot continued. And he will be able, at his leisure, to come back and destroy this solitary piece of evidence against him. Then, all the time, it was in the spill vase in Mrs. Inglethorpe's bedroom, under our very noses? I cried. Poirot nodded. Yes, my friend. That is where I discovered my last link, and I owe that very fortunate discovery to you. To me? Yes. Do you remember telling me that my hand shook as I was straightening the ornaments on the mantelpiece? Yes, but I don't see. No, but I saw. Do you know, my friend, I remembered that earlier in the morning, when we had been there together, I had straightened all the objects on the mantelpiece, and, if they were already straightened, there would be no need to straighten them again, unless, in the meantime, someone else had touched them. Dear me, I murmured, so that is the explanation of your extraordinary behavior. You rushed down to Stiles and found it still there? Yes, and it was a race for time. But I still can't understand why Inglethorpe was such a fool as to leave it there when he had plenty of opportunity to destroy it. Ah, but he had no opportunity. I saw to that. You? Yes. Do you remember reproving me for taking the household into my confidence on the subject? Yes. Well, my friend, I saw there was just one chance. I was not sure then if Inglethorpe was the criminal or not, but if he was I reasoned that he would not have the paper on him, but would have hidden it somewhere, and by enlisting the sympathy of the household I could effectually prevent his destroying it. He was already under suspicion, and by making the matter public I secured the services of about ten amateur detectives, who would be watching him unceasingly, 
and being himself aware of their watchfulness he would not dare seek further to destroy the document. He was therefore forced to depart from the house, leaving it in the spill vase. But surely Miss Howard had ample opportunities of aiding him. Yes, but Miss Howard did not know of the paper's existence. In accordance with their prearranged plan, she never spoke to Alfred Inglethorpe. They were supposed to be deadly enemies, and until John Cavendish was safely convicted they neither of them dared risk a meeting. Of course I had a watch kept on Mr. Inglethorpe, hoping that sooner or later he would lead me to the hiding place. But he was too clever to take any chances. The paper was safe where it was, since no one had thought of looking there in the first week, it was not likely they would do so afterwards. But for your lucky remark, we might never have been able to bring him to justice. I understand that now, but when did you first begin to suspect Miss Howard? When I discovered that she had told a lie at the inquest about the letter she had received from Mrs. Inglethorpe. Why, what was there to lie about? You saw that letter? Do you recall its general appearance? Yes more or less. You will recollect, then, that Mrs. Inglethorpe wrote a very distinctive hand, and left large clear spaces between her words. But if you look at the date at the top of the letter you will notice that July 17 th is quite different in this respect. Do you see what I mean? No, I confessed, I don't. You do not see that that letter was not written on the 17th, but on the 7th the day after Miss Howard's departure, the one was written in before the 7 to turn it into the 17th. But why? That is exactly what I asked myself. Why does Miss Howard suppress the letter written on the 17th, and produce this faked one instead? Because she did not wish to show the letter of the 17th. Why, again? And at once a suspicion dawned in my mind. You will remember my saying that it was wise to beware of people who were not telling you the truth. And yet, I cried indignantly, after that, you gave me two reasons why Miss Howard could not have committed the crime. And very good reasons too, replied Poirot. For a long time they were a stumbling block to me until I remembered a very significant fact, that she and Alfred Inglethorpe were cousins. She could not have committed the crime single-handed, but the reasons against that did not debar her from being an accomplice. And, then, there was that rather over-vehement hatred of hers. It concealed a very opposite emotion. There was, undoubtedly, a tie of passion between them long before he came to Styles. They had already arranged their infamous plot that he should marry this rich, but rather foolish old lady, induce her to make a will leaving her money to him, and then gain their ends by a very cleverly conceived crime. If all had gone as they planned, they would probably have left England, and lived together on their poor victim's money. They are a very astute and unscrupulous pair. While suspicion was to be directed against him, she would be making quiet preparations for a very different denouement. She arrives from Middlingham with all the compromising items in her possession. No suspicion attaches to her. No notice is paid to her coming and going in the house. She hides the strychnine and glasses in John's room. She puts the beard in the attic. She will see to it that sooner or later they are duly discovered. I don't quite see why they try to fix the blame on John, I remarked. It would have been much easier for them to bring the crime home to Lawrence. Yes, but that was mere chance. All the evidence against him arose out of pure accident. It must, in fact, have been distinctly annoying to the pair of schemers. His manner was unfortunate, I observed thoughtfully. Yes. You realize, of course, what was at the back of that? No. You did not understand that he believed Mademoiselle Cynthia guilty of the crime? No, I exclaimed, astonished. Impossible. Not at all. I myself nearly had the same idea. It was in my mind when I asked Mr. Wells that first question about the will. Then there were the bromide powders which he had made up, and her clever male impersonations, as Dorcas recounted them to us, there was really more evidence against her than anyone else. You are joking, Poirot. No. Shall I tell you what made Monsieur Lawrence turn so pale when he first entered his mother's room on the fatal night? It was because, whilst his mother lay there, obviously poisoned, he saw, over your shoulder, 
that the door into Mademoiselle Cynthia's room was unbolted. But he declared that he saw it bolted. I cried. Exactly, said Poirot dryly. And that was just what confirmed my suspicion that it was not. He was shielding Mademoiselle Cynthia. But why should he shield her? Because he is in love with her. I laughed. There, Poirot, you are quite wrong. I happen to know for a fact that, far from being in love with her, he positively dislikes her. Who told you that, mon ami? Cynthia herself. La pauvre petite. And she was concerned? She said that she did not mind at all. Then she certainly did mind very much, remarked Poirot. They are like that, les femmes. What you say about Lawrence is a great surprise to me, I said. But why? It was most obvious. Did not Monsieur Lawrence make the sour face every time Mademoiselle Cynthia spoke and laughed with his brother? He had taken it into his long head that Mademoiselle Cynthia was in love with Monsieur John. When he entered his mother's room, and saw her obviously poisoned, he jumped to the conclusion that Mademoiselle Cynthia knew something about the matter. He was nearly driven desperate. First he crushed the coffee cup to powder under his feet, remembering that she had gone up with his mother the night before, and he determined that there should be no chance of testing its contents. Thenceforward, he strenuously, and quite uselessly, upheld the theory of death from natural causes. And what about the extra coffee cup? I was fairly certain that it was Mrs. Cavendish who had hidden it, but I had to make sure. Monsieur Lawrence did not know at all what I meant, but, on reflection, he came to the conclusion that if he could find an extra coffee cup anywhere his lady love would be cleared of suspicion. And he was perfectly right. One thing more. What did Mrs. Inglethorpe mean by her dying words? They were, of course, an accusation against her husband. Dear me, Poirot, I said with a sigh, I think you have explained everything. I am glad it has all ended so happily. Even John and his wife are reconciled. Thanks to me. How do you mean, thanks to you? My dear friend, do you not realize that it was simply and solely the trial which has brought them together again? That John Cavendish still loved his wife, I was convinced, also, that she was equally in love with him. But they had drifted very far apart. It all arose from a misunderstanding. She married him without love. He knew it. He is a sensitive man in his way, he would not force himself upon her if she did not want him. And, as he withdrew, her love awoke. But they are both unusually proud, and their pride held them inexorably apart. He drifted into an entanglement with Mrs. Rikes, and she deliberately cultivated the friendship of Dr. Bowerstein. Do you remember the day of John Cavendish's arrest, when you found me deliberating over a big decision? Yes, I quite understood your distress. Pardon me, mon ami, but you did not understand it in the least. I was trying to decide whether or not I would clear John Cavendish at once. I could have cleared him though it might have meant a failure to convict the real criminals. They were entirely in the dark as to my real attitude up to the very last moment which partly accounts for my success. Do you mean that you could have saved John Cavendish from being brought to trial? Yes, my friend. But I eventually decided in favor of a woman's happiness. Nothing but the great danger through which they have passed could have brought these two proud souls together again. I looked at Poirot in silent amazement. The colossal cheek of the little man. Who on earth but Poirot would have thought of a trial for murder as a restorer of conjugal happiness? I perceive your thoughts, mon ami, said Poirot, smiling at me. No one but Hercule Poirot would have attempted such a thing. And you are wrong in condemning it. The happiness of one man and one woman is the greatest thing in all the world. His words took me back to earlier events. I remembered Mary as she lay white and exhausted on the sofa, listening, listening. There had come the sound of the bell below. She had started up. Poirot had opened the door, and meeting her agonized eyes had nodded gently. Yes, madam, he said. I have brought him back to you. He had stood aside, and as I went out I had seen the look in Mary's eyes, as John Cavendish had caught his wife in his arms. Perhaps you are right, Poirot, I said gently. Yes, it is the greatest thing in the world. 
Suddenly, there was a tap at the door, and Cynthia peeped in. I, I only. Come in, I said, springing up. She came in, but did not sit down. I only wanted to tell you something. Yes? Cynthia fidgeted with a little tassel for some moments, then, suddenly exclaiming, you dears. Kissed first me and then Poirot, and rushed out of the room again. What on earth does this mean? I asked, surprised. It was very nice to be kissed by Cynthia, but the publicity of the salute rather impaired the pleasure. It means that she has discovered Monsieur Lawrence does not dislike her as much as she thought, replied Poirot philosophically. But. Here he is. Lawrence at that moment passed the door. A. Monsieur Lawrence, called Poirot. We must congratulate you, is it not so? Lawrence blushed, and then smiled awkwardly. A man in love is a sorry spectacle. Now Cynthia had looked charming. I sighed. What is it, mon ami? Nothing, I said sadly. They are two delightful women. And neither of them is for you? Finished Poirot. Never mind. Console yourself, my friend. We may hunt together again, who knows? And then. The end. Thank you for listening to today's episode I really hoped you enjoyed it. There will be more to come, please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to pixabay.com. Sheila